Good morning, everyone. How are you all? So we're now ready for our um, last academic session of our UFMG Summer School in Brazilian Studies. And um, thanks again for your presence and thanks again for being here with us, for sticking around and being with us and hanging on tight to this great ship of our Summer School in Brazilian Studies. And um, today we're delightful to have uh, and Professor Cristiano Rodrigues. It's such a great honor to have you here with us. Thank you very much. Uh, it's such a great topic and an important topic and we're, um, we're gonna end in a very, very high note with Professor Cristiano uh, today talking about race in Brazil. And uh, we're honored to have him here with us. Uh, and, and it's a, an honor and also a great pleasure to hear a bit from you um, to enlighten our very last day. Well, my, my heart's hurting because it's the last day, <laughs> but we're still gonna have some time to have some fun uh, later on in the afternoon um, with the luau. I think it's gonna be really nice also. But then right now I'll pass the floor to Professor Cristiano. Good morning, Professor. How are you? Good morning. I'm good. Great. I mean, so, I'll, pass, as as I'll pass the floor good. to you. Thank you ever so All much right. for being here with us on a Saturday morning. All right. Thank you so much for the invitation. I mean, it's a pleasure sure. to be uh, doing this closing session of um, this academic summer school. Um, as Luciana told me, told I will be talking about uh, race in Brazil, which is a very broad topic. And I chose to talk about uh, a very specific thing, which is uh, the underrepresentation of blacks in, politi in politics in Brazil, in national politics in Brazil. So I will um, do, let me share my screen first. And then. Uh, so we can here. I'm doing it wrong again. Sorry. <laughs> How do I share this? It's coming. <laughs> oh, it's sharing. Oh, it's, it's it's starting. It's charging. I can see mine. <laughs> uh, here, is sharing with you guys. Yes. Now yes? you will have it. Yes. That's All right. right. Great. Um, technical problems. It happens. All right. So the topic is race in Brazil. And this is how I'm gonna be uh, dividing my time here. If I will just um, see how much time we still have left. But I will talk first on uh, race and racism in Brazil. So basically we'll be talking about the origins or um, uh, how racism works in Brazil and how we think about race differently from other countries. Cause I know you guys are from all over the world. So probably uh, there are some uh, particularities and some differences in the way we deal with race and race and racism in Brazil uh, that might not be familiar to many of you. And then I'll talk a very little, uh, I mean, that's gonna be a very short time about race, class and social mobility in Brazil because the points I wanna make on how race affects uh, political representation in Brazil has to do with social mobility. Um, and then I will go to actually uh, is the topic I, I'm going to tackle here, which is race and political representation in Brazil. And I will be talking about two things. The first one is the effects of racism on national, national politics, and then the importance of descriptive representation, uh, in which I will use a, a case study. Uh, there's a research I'm doing with uh, some colleagues on um, uh, on the presentation of black, especially black women in Brazil uh, in national politics. All right. 
So <laughs> to start, I'd like to say the, as I said, now race is such a broad and complex topic uh, in any country that's a multiracial country, and especially in Brazil, uh, that has a, a very long history of slavery and its legacy in the Brazilian society to today. Um, as many of you guys must be aware, uh, the Brazilian, uh, we had a very long period of slavery in Brazil, which lasted more than 300 years. And then uh, the beginning, uh, we started to think about race uh, later on, basically when slavery was about to be abolished. And you guys also know that uh, Brazil was the last uh, Western country to abolish, to abolish uh, slavery in the late 80s, uh, 1800, in the late 1800s. Uh, so here I say, so until the mid 1800s, Brazilian society didn't think of itself in terms of race. Uh, because we had people who are free, uh, and then the masters and slaves. So race wasn't a category to identify uh, uh, that Brazilians used to identify themselves uh, in that moment. Then, by the end of slavery, the question about what to do with the blacks emerged. And why this question emerged? Uh, back in the day, black Brazilians were roughly... Um, two thirds of the Brazilian population. Uh, blacks, and I mean blacks and mixed race Brazilians. And then there was this whole conversation back in the day about um, what made a society a uh, developed society. And that had to do a lot with a thing called um, scientific races, uh, which portrayed white European traits as being more important and have more value than those of other race and ethnicities. And then this question, especially coming from the Brazilian political and economical elites, was about, uh, okay, in a country with so many Blacks, so many mixed race people, how can we be developed? Now, how can we develop this country? Uh, that's, that's how the question about um, uh, what to do with the Blacks emerged. And then um, the way Brazilians tried, oh, oh, the, 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 the political establishment in Brazil um, decided to tackle this question was uh, by sponsoring the immigration of white Europeans to whiten the society. So from 1880 until the 1930s, the Brazilian state sponsored the immigration of about uh, three point. 0.5 million white Europeans, especially from Italy, Germany, and Spain. And uh, what was the, the underlining tone of these uh, immigration uh, politics? Was that the state portrayed, as I said before, an African blood as inferior to European blood and promoted immigration policies to widen and thereby improve the population. They, the idea was the, the idea behind all this was that if you had um, uh, white Europeans mixing with uh, uh, Africans, then um, across the generations, you would have uh, a society that was wider than it was before. So there was an interpretation of um, the, the evolutionist theory. There was a very bad interpretation, but anyways. Uh, here, I can show you guys, there's this graph in which I, I, I show uh, how many Africans were brought to Brazil. And then I'm using, so from 1781 until 1855. Uh, uh, so they're like, there are, there are disputes among historians of uh, about how many Africans were brought to Brazil. But this number is roughly uh, between 3 million and 5 million, depending on how one accounts it, accounts for it. Uh, but that was in around like two, three centuries. Then, when we see the European immigration to, Braz uh, to Brazil, as I said before, they started um, in the 1800s and lasted until, and then the, the data I have here is from uh, 1820 until 1975. You guys can see that there's very little immigration in Brazil until 1870s, until the 1870s. And then there's a very large number of uh, uh, immigration, a very large of number of people coming to Brazil 
uh, from this time that I mentioned, which is the 1880 until the 30s, and then the number diminished again. Uh, what does that mean? As I said, that was a, an estate policy. Um, the people who came to Brazil, uh, they had their tickets paid by the government. Some of them got um, a piece of land in which they could uh, live and work. And they, they, they also took uh, the place in the, co the coffee farms that, bef that, that before were, uh, that the slaves worked before for free and they were paid to work there. So many of the Brazilian uh, socioeconomic inequalities that still affects blacks uh, today uh, have to do with this, this process of um, shifting from the uh, slave, uh, these, from slavery to the free work. Uh, in which uh, the, the Afro-Brazilians or the Brazilians of African descent uh, had no chance uh, to work or to, uh, or, or to be uh, incorporated uh, to the job market in the same ways as the European ones who came to replace them in the job market had. And then um, some uh, specificities of the Brazilian of race and racism in Brazil. So uh, because Brazil is such a mixed country uh, and, 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 and sometimes it's hard to tell whether somebody is black or white. I mean, that's what the, 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 the popular vision of Brazil says. It's not something that I particularly agree with. Uh, so race in Brazil refers mostly to skin color of phys physical appearance rather than to ancestry. And another thing is that Brazil is a nation that on the surface appears to be colorblind, but where the legacy of slavery remains. And Brazilians confuse racial coexistence with racial equality. What I wanna, um, uh, so what do I want to highlight with these uh, three topics? That because there's like this, this, this idea of a country who is racially democratic in which, uh, so what, what this myth of racial democracy tells about Brazil, that there's no difference between Brazilians based on skin color, that our differences are mostly based on social status. But at the same time, uh, the darker someone's skin color is, the more uh, prejudiced this person faces um, in her life. And that's why I wanna say that like the physical appearance is very important in Brazil uh, to describe uh, or to, to see whether or not somebody has had uh, some difficulties in their lives based on racism. And another thing is because um, because Brazil didn't have um, uh, a state-sponsored laws that segregated uh, black Brazilians from white Brazilians, we sometimes use the idea that we all live together, that we coexist as a sign of racial equality. When it's quite the opposite, and 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 and, and also uh, it's not true that there's no. Uh, um, segregation in Brazil. It's just that the segregation is more, um, it's a mix of class and in race. So another thing is uh, race classification in Brazil works in a continuum that goes from white to black in which people want to identify themselves and be identified by others with the former category, but not with the latter one. And Another thing, which uh, each Brazilian thinks of himself as being an island of racial democracy surrounded uh, by racists from outside. Though some uh, scholars have said that um, Brazil is a country uh, where there is racism, but not racists, which is that a lot of a lot of people say uh, they. Uh, there are a lot of research saying that Brazilians see races, but they don't see themselves as uh, being racist or acting uh, in a ways that discriminate against black people. And that's a very uh, weird thing about Brazilians. So <coughs> in Brazil, Afro-Brazilians are the majority of the population. 
So that's why I'm calling them here uh, the majority minority, because demographically, we are a majority, but social psychologically, we are a minority. And uh, because the myth of this racial democracy and the white wing ideologies just weighted down black identity. So Afro-Brazilians have a weak racial consciousness. This has, has changed over the years. Uh, and also Brazilians use hundreds of terms to classify one another according to skin color and phenotypical traits. There is this quote uh, from a person, uh, Robin Sheriff, uh, there is a share here that says, any given race or color term can in a given uh, conversation be used to describe, to tease, to insult, or to flatter. So it's very common in Brazil that the same expression that one used to um, discriminate against somebody can be used to flatter this person. And you can do this like in, um, uh, um, right away. It, does, it, it doesn't have to be, um, uh, you, you don't need to, to, think of, to think a lot about it. It's just, people just do it. Uh, and also, there are like so many ways to describe one skin's color. And I'm gonna show you based on these data I have here which is back in 1976, the Brazilian census asked uh, Brazilians what was their color and race. And this question was an open, open question. So there was no uh, box they, they, they had to check. And uh, so they came up with 135 colors. Um, they're in Portuguese, and so some of you guys might not uh, might not understand them. But what are, what is the character, like the main feature of uh, these many colors Brazilians use to identify themselves? The first one I would say is that the idea that color is something that you transition uh, to and from. It's not a very definite, fixed uh, mark. Uh, so people would say there is a question. There is like somebody who was tanned, as if uh, the person went to, uh, I don't know, to the beach and then spent the day there and the person became, um, the, the, the skin tone was darker at night because of that. And then somebody says, because I'm walking, I'm walking in certain way, I look like that way. Uh, so the, the, the idea that color is transitional, uh, it's very salient in Brazil and it represents the idea uh, that somehow we uh, think that we can move uh, move our color according to our own interests and the social context around us. So it's um, uh, in, in, uh, there's another um, uh, saying in Brazil. Uh, it's, it's very common that people say that money whitens. What what does that mean? It means the following: that if somebody uh, has gotten money, has gotten richer. Uh, even if this person is of African descent, she or he will be seen as a white person. This is not true at all, um, but I'm not gonna go into this question. It's just, uh, it, it explains how Brazilians see color in a very fluid way. It's not so fixed as, for example, uh, in the West. Um, and also we have different ways of classificating uh, race in Brazil. The, you have the census category, which um, divides the population into white, brown, black, native, uh, are the indigenous, and yellow, which are the Asians. Uh, uh, and, then, and then you have an extra official categories that like how Brazilians uh, see themselves. Moreno is a very uh, broad and uh, com commonly used category uh, that encompasses white people, brown people, and black people. Somebody can be, like a Moreno can be a person who is white but has darker features like black hair, uh, black eyes, and stuff like that. But also can, mean, can be a person who is black as me. Uh, and then you have uh, gradations of Moreno because you can have a um, uh, darker Moreno and you can have a Moreno who is called like Moreno Claro, which should be somebody uh, who has a more uh, European-ish feature, uh, as they said. And then um, the black social movements, 
uh, back in the 1970s, um, using the data from the government, understood that blacks and browns, uh, browns meaning the people who are mixed race in Brazil, uh, they were basically living under the same circumstances. Therefore, uh, we could just mix them together uh, in ways of promoting public policies. So that's um, usually like when you read uh, sociological or political research on a race in Brazil, they usually put together black and brown as, as a meaning that uh, the, the social conditions, conditions of mixed race people and black people are basically the same in white people. So that's the, 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 uh, the third category here that I'm showing about the government and the black movement discussion, distinction, sorry. Um, and then in terms of uh, research, how, how did the research on race relations um, have evolved uh, in these years? So back in the 30s, 1930s, uh, the research on race relations in Brazil would say there was zero or no racial discrimination in the country. Um, the main author uh, who pointed to this idea was Gilberto Freire, uh, and then many others uh, that I cite here. The idea behind uh, this was the following. Racial differences are conditioned by class. So class is the main Brazilian divide for this uh, theory. And racial discrimination uh, is something that happens according to class. As I said before, uh, like the, the saying uh, follows uh, that uh, money whitens was basically this idea that like if somebody has money, uh, then racism doesn't affect this person, which again, uh, it's not true. Then there was a second wave of research that began in the 50s that would say racial discrimination is widespread, but transitory. Uh, that, and Florestan Fernandes, which is um, a great Brazilian sociologist, um, was the main author who, who said such a thing. Uh, for him and many of his colleagues back then, racism was persistent, but incompatible with economic development. What, did they, what they wanted to say about this uh, was that as Brazilian became a more capitalist and developed society, uh, racism would disappear. But then you have the, the, the research um, uh, from the 80s on that are saying, oh, racism is widespread, um, persistent and structural. That it's plainly uh, that racism is, is actually compatible with economic development. There's no uh, that the, the economic that development wouldn't um, uh, weigh down uh, racism in the country. So here I have some data. They are like not very new, uh, but um, you still you guys can still. Uh, understand. So the, the color race composition of the Brazilian population based in a 2008 uh, sample. Uh, here in the south, the southern part of Brazil, you have a population that is mostly white, as you can see uh, uh, here. And then in the southeast of Brazil, which is this part here, you have a population that is still more white and black. And then in the northeastern part of Brazil, the population is mostly black and mixed race. And in the, north, uh, in the northern part of Brazil, you have a population that's um, indigenous, uh, blacks, and more mixed. Uh, so here also there is this division. Uh, there you can say the, uh, in, in blue here, you can see the, the white population. It's around 48% uh, of the population. Then you have uh, this um, light green here. There is the pardo, pardo means brown, oh, I'm translating here as brown, which is roughly 44% uh, of the population. Then you have 65% uh, of the population uh, who describe themselves as black. And then 0.9% uh, of the population uh, who describe themselves as native um, of Asian descent and other uh, race ethnicities. 
Um, another way to see like how race and class work in Brazil is based on the HDI, HDI like the Human Development Index. So I made this, uh, this figure here in which you guys can see that the wider the population, the higher the HDI. So in the southern part of Brazil, uh, where the, the white population is uh, roughly uh, above 75%, you have a HDI that's better, uh, that's higher than in the north is, uh, north is part of Brazil, uh, where the, population, the white population is below 50%. Uh, so the southern part of Brazil, compared to its uh, northern part, uh, the southern part of Brazil uh, has more infrastructure, uh, more access to education, uh, health, and other um, socioeconomic uh, things. And the other parts of Brazil lack on those things. And there is a relation of, there's a correlation between the color uh, of the majority of their population, and also this uh, HCI. And that brings me to, um, I think I'm ending to uh, this, this part of the section, uh, on race, class, and social mobility in Brazil. As I tried to say uh, uh, before, the race and class are interconnected variables. So in Brazil, blacks and browns represent a higher percentage of those who grew up in lower economic classes. Although 56% of the total population, blacks and browns, uh, compose 64% of people living uh, below the poverty line and 69% of those living in extremely poor uh, conditions. And while a 25-year-old white Brazilian has an average 8.4 years of schooling, a black and brown Brazilian of the same age has only 60.1 years of schooling. Uh, education is a major uh, predict, uh, predictor of income. And although the average educational levels of both black and white Brazilians have increased significantly over the 20th century, the gap between them has remained relatively constant. So illiteracy among blacks and browns over 15 years of age is 28% versus 16% among whites. 52% uh, of blacks live in households without adequate sanitations sanitation versus 28% of whites. 30% of blacks live in households without trash collection versus 15% of whites. And 26% of blacks live in households without running water versus 8% of whites. So here you can see how uh, the, the, the relationship between race and class runs deep in the country. Uh, and, it's, it's, and it's almost impossible to differentiate one to the other. <laughs> Um, okay, and then I come to my to the second and the final part of my of my talk here, which is how this conundrum of race and class plays in political uh, in the political arena in Brazil. So my question is, why do blacks remain underrepresented uh, in national politics in Brazil? And I I try to answer this this question. Uh, by focusing on three hypotheses. One is the one I'm calling party recruitment. The one, resource. And the third one, racism. Uh, Brazilian is a multi-party system. Uh, we, we, we have more than 30 parties uh, nowadays. And the way they recruit people to be candidates, uh, sometimes, of uh, make, makes the way that uh, white Brazilians are overrepresented. Another thing is the first: how much money a candidate has uh, is a very is a very good way for one to know uh, the chances this person has to be elected or not. And I will show you guys how the the party resource uh, is distributed in a way that blacks and browns get fewer uh, get less money than uh, white people. And then of course, racism, and I'm gonna be showing you this. 
so here there's this uh, graph that was made by Jaime Nicolau, um, a political scientist from here, Janeiro, uh, and I took from him, uh, that uh, talks about the probability of being elected according to skin color. Uh, so here uh, we have, oh, sorry. Uh, this red line are the white people. The green line are the brown people and the blue line are the black people. And here, how much money? The, there's a thing called electoral fund in Brazil. They're sponsored by the state um, that gives money to the parties to spend and the candidates. So here this, uh, this is, um, um, so on this axis, we can find the amount of money uh, the party spends in a candidate. So if a candidate, if a candidate gets 500,000 reais, the chance of being elected is very low. If the candidate gets a million reais, the chances are high. And so it's true for 1.5 million, then 2 million, and 2 million and a half. But then you guys can see that even though, like, even if uh, a black person gets the same amount of money as a white person, uh, the white person is still gets more chance to be elected than, uh, than uh, a white person still has more chance to be elected than a black person. So money uh, is an important way to know whether or not somebody will be elected, but it's not the only uh, thing to be looking at. Okay. Um, all right. And here there's another um, uh, graph by the same uh, political scientist, which is the 2018 electoral fund spending uh, by color again. So here the black line, uh, this black line here is the median, uh, um, uh, the median, the mean, the median fund spending by 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 race. So white people. Uh, in the same party, got way more money than black people. So black people are the red one now, uh, white people are the blue, and brown people are the orange. So you see that uh, white people get way more money, not only they get more money, but if you see also the points here, uh, you have more people, more people here on this upper level getting more money than you have black people here on this upper level. And, and the same goes for brown people. And if, um, um, as the previous graph shows, that money is a good predator uh, of one's ability to being elected, of course, if one gets more money, it gets, the person gets more chance to be elected. So the way, uh, not only the way the party recruit uh, their candidates, but the way um, they share money among them uh, it's, it's an indicative of who will be elected and who will not be elected. Another uh, graph with the same, also by Jaro Nicolau, that shows the party electoral fund revenue distribution by color. So here they show, uh, he shows uh, uh, different Brazilian parties. Um, I'm gonna be showing like, um, uh, PT, which is the workers' party, uh, the, um, was in office for 16 years in Brazil. So PT has spent, so the green line, uh, the green column here, are the black, uh, the white people, the orange are brown people, and the, I don't know which color is this, purple, is uh, black people. So you, you see that like uh, white people get twice as much money than the other uh, race in PT. And then in the other parties, like uh, them, uh, which is a, a, um, a right-wing party, uh, whites get even more money than blacks. MDB, which is a party from the center, center right, uh, also gives way more money to whites. Uh, the only party that, 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 that gives money uh, in an even way for whites, brown, and black people is PSOL, which is very small uh, party from the left. But all the other ones, you see that the distribution of money is not even. 
And that has effect on who gets elected or not. <coughs> then there's this uh, study by Natalia Bueno and Dani uh, that was published in 2017, talking about, the, the, uh, about race, resources, and representation. So she, uh, they show on this on their paper that uh, so they show like the 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 the, uh, the difference in terms of representation uh, and the population and the size of the population in the Brazilian society. So here with like the darker gray is the um, uh, the white population in Brazil. So this is like forty something percent, as I showed you guys before. In terms of uh, elected politicians, they are uh, they are roughly eighty percent. So there's an overrepresentation of white Brazilians in politics, especially white male Brazilians. I'm not talking about gender here, but the gender gap uh, in politics is also as wide as the gender gap uh, by race in Brazil. Uh, and for black women, is even wider. Uh, but because I have to. Uh, to keep a focus, <laughs> I, will, I will be tackling this one. Uh, so brown, the same way, the same way. So uh, brown people are like roughly 40% of the population. And in terms of those who are elected, they're around 20%. Blacks, they're 10% of the population or, or, uh, or less than that. And, uh, and roughly half of them get elected to offices. And the Asians and uh, native Brazilian, like the numbers also very low, but their representation in the population is also low. Uh, here, another research by uh, Rios Pereira and Rangel that was also published in 2017, that shows the elections in 2014. So on the right side, my right side, uh, you have uh, the percentage of candidates and then on the left side, you have the percentage of those who are elected. So for white people, uh, like they were 50, oh, they are 50, 80% of the candidates and they made up 79% of the elected. And uh, black and browns, blacks and browns, they were like 41%, sorry. They were like 41% of the candidates uh, and 20% of the elected. <coughs> Here, the same research shows the, 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 um, uh, how the Brazilian Congress works, uh, again, for the 2014 election. So in the Senate, you had no Black people. Uh, uh, the H here um, is male, and the M here is female. Uh, in the in the lower house, uh, in the lower house we have uh, 513 seats. Uh, so the lower house with 513 seats, 19 were for black um, uh, politicians, uh, men, and three black women. Then uh, <coughs> Pardus, which are the Browns, we, we had 74 male and seven, seven female uh, politicians elected in 2014. And then in the Senate, we had uh, for Brown, four males and one female. And then whites, you have in the Senate a whole lot. Uh, way more. So we had 18 uh, elected, uh, 18 white male elected, and four female. Uh, in, the, in the lower house, the number of white people elected were 369 and female 41. Again, this is, um, this is a data I collected from a, a Brazilian newspaper uh, on the election day. That also um, shows the, 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 the size of the Brazilian population and their representation in the Congress. Uh, here is in, on, the, on, on the lower house again. You have, uh, so 47 uh, 
0.5% um, of white people in the Brazilian population, and they represent 75% of the lower house. This is for the 2018 elections, because before I was showing you the data for the 2014, now the 2018. Um, so the blacks and browns make up roughly 50.9% of the population in 2018, uh, and they made up 24% of the seats uh, in the lower house in 2018. <laughs> and that uh, brings me to the last uh, part of my talk, in which I'll be asking you, in which I'm asking, based on my own research, the following question, how to curb this uh, underrepresentation of black people uh, in the national um, politic? politics. Uh, and then I'm, 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 I'm trying to work or if uh, I'm studying um, uh, a case of mandatos coletivos or uh, like collective mandates in Brazil. Uh, they're like an attempt made by especially black women and some uh, LGBT people uh, to be elected to office um, in uh, making like candidates that, that work as a collective. I will explain that later. Uh, and working with this descriptive representation. So what is a descriptive representation? It's the idea that a group elects an individual to represent them who in their own characteristics mirror some of the more frequent experiences and outward manifestations of the group. So that was a definition by, the, by Mansbridge. Uh, and how to curb a democratic deficit. So when a decision shape in our lives, are made by assemblies composed overwhelmingly of men, of those uh, with no experience of discrimination or insecurity, of those from the society's ethnic majority. Uh, so this, uh, the idea is that uh, there is a, def a democratic deficit when not everyone is uh, represented into politics, in the politics. So my case study is uh, this collective mandates they are um, a novelty in Brazilian politics. They started in 2016. In 2016, in the local elections here in Belo Horizonte, uh, for the uh, uh, for the city supervisor, uh, for to be a, a city supervisor, uh, there was these 12 people uh, who came together, and they would ask like vote and me, but also vote in somebody else from the same um, uh, from the same group. Uh, here are some of them, but this is this is a picture from them in the election, 2018 election, not the 2016. And then the um, two people were elected back in 2016. Aure Carolina, that is this this person here. She was the most uh, voted um, uh, person. Uh, to the um, city, to be a city supervisor back in 2016 in Belo Horizonte. Um, and also Cida Falabella was elected with her and they made a thing called Gabinetona. Gabinetona is a, gabinet is a cabinet. So Gabinetona is a, is a, is a bigger, larger cabinet uh, in which they open up the space. There was no divisions between the, uh, the space and they had the thing that they called co supervision, so the co-supervisors, uh, in which all the candidates that were not elected with them also worked uh, assessing them, uh, but they were uh, not leg legally, but uh, in fact, uh, also supervised, supervisors. So they were working together uh, in, a, in, 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 in a way that's very collective. Uh, then this, this idea that uh, was brought up by Gabinetona uh, was replicated in 2018 by two other groups who also got elected. The Juntas, Juntas is, means together, which is a group from um, Recife, if I'm not mistaken. And they also got an ass, uh, they got a seat at uh, the state, um, the state assembly in uh, Pernambuco. E a bancada ativista, um, it's an activist cabinet um, that elected um, state deputies in São Paulo. And also in Belo Horizonte, Aura Carolina, oh, it's this person here, she was elected to be a federal deputy in 2018. Uh, in um, Andreas Jesus, uh, this one here, 
She was elected to uh, be a state deputy here in Minas Gerais. And now Gabinetona has what they call a three-level uh, cabinet. That was on the federal level, on the state level, and the municipal level. And Juntas on the state and Bancada Ativista on the state, but now so they're also running uh, collective candidacies to uh, city supervisors in different cities again uh, in Brazil. So what is interesting about the, <laughs> this, this mandates uh, is that they, they bring up to the politics, they bring up to the, uh, to the parliament questions there's some, uh, they're usually forgotten by white male politicians. I will not be talking about everything they do here because I still wanna hear from you guys, your thoughts and, 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 and get questions from you. But <laughs> here you can see uh, the things they work with. There's a thing in Brazil called public audiences. What are the public audiences? They will bring uh, people who are experts in the topic, the politicians and uh, the constituency people to talk about themes that are of uh, the interest that they may be of interest for the population. Or they may, uh, uh, and usually you talk about economic issues, social issues and things like that. But then uh, the collective mandates, they usually talk about culture, education, um, what they call uh, popular, popular economy, um, the thing that's like um, urban occupation that, that's very common in Brazil because you have a shortage of housing in Brazil. And then there's a lot of uh, urban occupation in Brazil and that, it, it, they want to try to uh, talk about that. They also talk a lot about human rights, LGBT rights, women rights, um, black people rights, uh, public health, and many other issues. And oh, finally, and finally, um, I have here the bills proposed by those collective mandates between 2017 and 2019. And you see that they propose many, uh, many bills that are uh, different from the ones that like more uh, uh, typical politicians do. So one is uh, popular participation and transparency. So they're very interested in, in like how to hold how to hold the politi uh, politics accountable. So that's why they work a lot on on, on, on um, uh, popular participation and transparency. Also um, in the environment. So there's a lot of uh, bills uh, grasping the question of environment questions. Uh, especially due to the disasters that happened in Minas Gerais and other states uh, in a few years back. Also public transportation, uh, public health, um, uh, women's rights, um, affirmative actions, um, um, LGBT plus people's rights, and then uh, indigenous people's rights, um, human rights, as I said, uh, urban occupation, uh, what else? Uh, working, workers' rights, education, and, 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 and uh, that's what the, the descriptive uh, representation brings to, to, to politics in Brazil. It doesn't, it doesn't change the landscape, but it brings up new uh, ideas and people who are before silence in the politics, especially black people, and um, which are the focus of what I'm talking here, but also people from other uh, disadvantaged groups. Um, so that's basically what I have to, to say now. And I would like to hear more from you guys what you think and, and have a, a, a conversation uh, because there are many things that I left out in this, in this talk. Uh, but we can we can talk about them if you guys want. Thank that you. Was, thank you so much, Professor. That was such an insightful presentation. I myself have many questions, but I'll keep myself to myself. And <laughs> yeah. how do I and share this thing here? And let's see what the guys have to say. So <laughs> Alexia asks, uh, Professor, do you think that the lack of representation and the fact that the black people don't recognize themselves as black as well inhibit us? from uniting as a racial group and fighting for our rights. And another thing, 
is defining yourself as morena or parda a kind of racism? Okay, so uh, can I ask the first question first? Uh, and then I go to the second. Uh, okay. There are a lot of research uh, back uh, because uh, in 2014, we didn't have data collected by color of politicians, of elected politicians. Uh, so the TSE, which is the um, Superior Electoral uh, Court in Brazil, uh, didn't collect data on color of the candidates in those elected to office. So we didn't have much data on, uh, like data those, those I showed you guys, uh, that could actually explain why so few Black Brazilians had access to office. Um, and this question that you, you posed was one of the questions, oh, uh, which is maybe uh, Black Brazilians don't see themselves as Blacks, therefore they don't vote for Black candidates. But then I would pose a question in another way. Why don't white Brazilians vote for Black, black candidates? Because I showed, um, let me see if I can go back here. Uh, just show this one. This is like, like the, 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 the percentage of, oh, sorry. Uh, the percentage of black candidates uh, in Brazil in 2014, 41% uh, of all the candidates in that year were black or brown, but only 20% of them were elected. So there's no, there's no shortage of black candidates. There is shortage, uh, shortage of those who are elected. And why this gap, this gap happens? One, one of the answers, like the easiest answer is resource. Those candidates have, uh, have, don't, don't have as much money, therefore they don't get elected because they don't have money. But why the population don't vote for them? So one part of the question is, yes, black people probably don't vote for them. But the second part of the question, yeah, white people also don't vote for them. And that explains why, like, so, so widespread, so how widespread racism in Brazil, uh, that makes it more difficult for those people to be elected. Uh, I don't know if I answered it, but the second question was about uh, if Moreno is, uh, what is, can you repeat it? <laughs> uh, if um, define yourselves as Morena or Parda is a kind of racism. Um, I wouldn't say so. Uh, for what reason? This is a country um, that discriminates against black people. Therefore, as I said before, uh, um, earlier in the, in the talk, that uh, people want to describe themselves, to see themselves as white, to get more privilege. Uh, and then when they see like the, the amount of difficulty they face for being black, I understand them trying to, you know, escape the prejudice by using categories. They're like the blur the line between white and black, because th that's what Moreno El Pardo does. It just blurs the line in a way that you cannot say, oh, this is this and this is that. Uh, it's a way of avoiding being uh, uh, subject to race of uh, to racism and discrimination. Uh, so I wouldn't say that's like self discrimination. It's more a way of coping with a society, a society that's very, and that's extremely racist. Perfect, that's perfect. Uh, then Luisa from WFMG, she has a question and it's a good question. Uh, professor, how do you think white people can help in this change and search for, in, for equality and, and anti-racism? And it's, it's a question, it's my question as well. I mean, what can we as white people do? What is our place in this fight? Um, I think um, this is a very, it's a hard question to answer uh, because there are many ways of doing so, of doing, uh, of, of helping. I, first, I, I think the first, the first thing is acknowledging um, oneself as being racist. And, and what I want to, let me explain that in a more deeper way. So I'm I'm a, I'm a man, and I and I and I and I get privileged. I'm privileged for being a man, uh, even though I don't necessarily seek for this privilege. So if I want to be anti, uh, if I want to help in gender equality, somehow I need to give up some of my privilege, or use my privilege in a way that women get to places that they wouldn't get. 
uh, because I'm getting there. Uh, but how can I do that if I don't see myself as somebody who benefits from sexism and misogyny in, in a country, even if I don't, if I don't personally, personally uh, act in a, re, in, a, in, in a misogynist way? Uh, so the first thing would be that in terms of white people, like recognizing that someone benefits from races and someone doesn't benefit. And how do you benefit? Many ways. And then you have to understand them and then give opportunities. I think that's more important than, um, I don't know, talk about it in public spaces or uh, uh, it's to use your, pal your platform uh, to give opportunities in terms of who you hire, um, uh, the unconscious bias you, you, you have and many other things. So that, like those are, are, are the first steps, uh, like recognizing oneself as somehow uh, being racist or benefiting from racism, then giving opportunities for those uh, who have who, who don't who don't have that those opportunities is a second thing, and um, I also think in terms of a more uh, macro uh, change, which is the, the 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 power structure at least in Brazil and many countries uh, over uh, is over represented by white people, and then the institutional change. Must come, must come from white people. So you have to promote also institutional change um, uh, in ways that you share. Like uh, I said, um, there is a problem with economic inequality and racial inequality. So if you change the terms of economic inequality, it will affect black people. But not only that, uh, but to change like the, the, the economic disparities, you need white people to take front. So those are some of the ideas that I came up uh, with right now, but like there are many other ones. Excellent. Um, I made a decision a long time ago. I made this decision. If I have a choice, I never vote for white men. Never. That would be a very great decision. I mean, I never. do that. I do that myself. I mean, I, I try not to vote for white male and choose. Uh, Whenever it's possible, a female yeah, because can... sometimes you don't have a choice, right? For example, yeah. for presidency, the second term, we, we didn't have a choice, right? We have to exactly. vote for a white man. When uh, you don't have a choice, but if you have, uh, you I just never, the, ever. Of, uh, yes. uh, the, the, the the programs they 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 have. Um, uh, I don't know how how close to your political ideology they are. I mean, you still you find like female candidates and uh, not non-white candidates that might represent yourself better than a white candidate. They do. <laughs> they always do. <laughs> okay. So Jessica has a question. Uh, Jessica asks, Professor, do you believe quotas for political parties would be a way to go? Oh. <laughs> okay. So let me explain that because we do have quotas um, uh, for um, in the parties in Brazil, they uh, we have quotas for women. Uh, these quotas were like thirty percent. Um, I, I now don't remember when they were proposed, but that was back in the nineties. And then what happened? When there was this quota for for women, uh, there was what we call orange candidacies, like uh, candidaturas laranjas. Uh, that basically means they would put a woman uh, in the in the bayout. Uh, but she wouldn't get money, she wouldn't get uh, TV time, she wouldn't get any power resource, and she was there only to make up a number. Uh, and then you, 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 didn't, uh, you didn't close the gap, uh, the representation gap between uh, women and men in office until today. Now we're, we're starting to uh, grasp with this question, doing the following, asking the parties to... Uh, uh, to share evenly the money they get between men and women. So the number of women elected in the last election was higher than before because of that, because resource is still the main, uh, uh, the main reason people get elected. Uh, so if you have caught us, and now there's a discussion, there's a Brazilian um, federal deputy, Benedito da Silva, who asked the, um, this year, uh, whether we could uh, we could use the same quota system or the same distribution of resources for black people. So she had a, a twofold question for 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 the TSE. The, the one is, can we also share 
uh, the electoral fund uh, between uh, blacks, black and white candidates in accordance to the way we do for men and women. So that meaning if, you, if, if a party has 40% of black candidates, 40% of the money the party gets to spend um, uh, in the election will have to be used uh, by black people. And the other question she asked is whether you can have a quota system in the party. I'm not sure if a quota system is what we need for the following reason, as I'm still showing here, we get, we, we do have a number of candidates uh, belonging, uh, uh, they're black and brown. They're equivalent to the Brazilian, uh, to the size of this population in Brazil. The problem is not if we don't, uh, it's not that we don't have these candidates. The problem is that they don't get elected. So I think the distribution of money is more important than quota in this moment. But again, I would still be willing to, to have a deeper conversation on that based on um, what kind of election we're talking about. So for the legislative, is one kind of election because you have many candidates. And, uh, and, but, like the sen uh, but even in the legislative, like the, the, uh, the Senate is more difficult to get or the executive branch is also more difficult. So I would, I would think about this in terms of um, um, the, 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 the place, uh, the, how the election is being held and to where the, the election is instead of like just going to the party. Because I think that would create difficulties as we have with a quota system in the university, for example, in which um, uh, we have a lot of fraud. So people would describe themselves as as black just to get more money and get a seat at the party. So I'm afraid that, uh, that, uh, that, 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 that a policy like that could cause uh, more harm than good. In, in, in the first, I mean, I'm, I'm just thinking about, uh, I'm not against it. <laughs> I'm just thinking, I'm just thinking about the, the, the problems it might have. And this is very much different from the quota system we have for universities, right? Yes. And uh, could you tell uh, everyone how important the quota system and what was the impact of the quota system in at the universities? For um, definitely. I. So I myself, even this presentation before coming up with the idea of talking about political representation, I was thinking about talking about uh, affirmative actions, uh, but because it's not my, my field of ex expertise, I was thinking that like, I mean, I just could, but I was going to use my personal experience as, 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 as a way to, to start talking about this. So back in the day, I, I went to the university in 2000. Uh, some of you weren't even born uh, at UFMG, so in a very prestigious uh, major. Um, back then, you had this vestibular that was very competitive. I remember there was like 40, uh, I don't remember, there was a, a lot of uh, competition, and I got there. Uh, and we were 50 people in a classroom, and only three of us were Black. I also remember that back in 2000, there was this, um, um, uh, the, Brazilian, uh, the Brazilian government had, had um, um, an agreement with um, African Portuguese speaking countries and in which they, uh, um, uh, some black students from Africa would, not, not necessarily black students, eh? but uh, students from Africa would come to study at UFMG in other Brazilian universities. And I remember many times being uh, mistaken uh, for an African foreign student uh, because like the numbers of us. Like the PECJ students, the PECJ exactly. students. Yeah, exactly. it's an agreement we have, uh, the federal government has for years since the, uh, the 60s, I guess, that we bring, um, not only African students, we had students from Chimor, we have students from, from, from South America, but the great majority are students coming from African countries to study the whole uh, undergraduate program here. That's, you're right. Exactly. So I remember like um, 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 uh, walking, walking down the campus and being mistaken for one of those students because they were like so, we are so few black Brazilian students uh, in the day that people wouldn't think one of us as, as, as a student uh, at UFMG. And then there was 2000, uh, the quota system became in 2003. 
uh, first at um, state universities in Rio de Janeiro, and then went to UNB, which is a federal university in Brasilia, a very important one. And then it became a uh, very common um, until it became a federal law in 2012. Okay, and then throughout the time I went to the US, I went to other countries to study, uh, and then I came back to Brazil. And I started teaching. Uh, first, uh, at Cefete, which is um, a, 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 a university here in Belo Horizonte, then I moved to another one, and, and then came back to FMUG. And I remember coming back to FMUG in 2016 as, as a professor, uh, 10 years after I left. Uh, and it was like the landscape was very different. I mean, it was very interesting to come to, to the campus and the class and to see how diverse it was uh, in terms of, not only in terms of race, but social class. I mean, you had more people coming from uh, lower middle class or uh, working class families. Uh, I think, I mean, the landscape changed so much. And also the themes, the questions the, 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 the students ask, uh, their interests, is, they are like so very different than the ones I had before. And I'm talking like 16 years difference from the moment I left, uh, from the moment I got to college and from the moment I got back to college as a professor. Uh, that was like, it's a huge difference. I mean, the way quota system works in Brazil, it has its problems, of course, so we have many problems, uh, but it has changed the, the, the university forever. I mean, it's, it's a very great thing. I, I, can't, um, I, I can't explain like how amazing it, it, it has been uh, so far. It's magical, right? I mean, yeah. because you can see, you can actually visualize yeah. the impact and the difference between, I mean, the color of the university and the style of the people, right? Exactly. Um, it's in. And uh, one interesting thing, I, I'm, I'm not sure what research was that, but they say sometimes the person that enters the university through the quota system, it, it starts with a small disadvantage, like in the first semester, but within like two or three semesters, they become equal or better than the ones that entered without the quota system, which is something interesting. Because yes, there's 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 a lot of research on that. Um, because one question people had before, and I remember this question being asked, even uh, uh, people even asked this question for me, and I was already a student, so that didn't matter for me. Uh, back then, but it would ask, so uh, the educational system will, uh, will get worse if those students come because they lack something. Uh, and then there's like this, this the many research showing that uh, they do get with a small disadvantage, as you said, but then I, uh, because sometimes they're like their own chance, like they're like the chance they have to move their lives. Uh, they change their lives in, 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 in very unexpected ways. Like they just, they just grab this question, they grab this opportunity in a way, in, 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 a, in a very, uh, in a way that other people don't do. So they get better. And also the university works in, 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 in at least in Brazil, the university works in, in a different way than like um, high school, middle school, elementary school. So the, the things you need to, uh, like the, the, the um, the tools you have, uh, you need to succeed in the university, usually are tools that those students have a lot. Like they, they're very resilient because they come from situations, they face a lot of discrimination, people look at them uh, with dismissal or, uh, or things like that. Uh, so they're very resilient. Uh, they, they have to do very different aspects of one circumstance uh, because some of them work and have a family in a situation that's not necessarily the situation a uh, upper middle class person has. Um, uh, so that uh, somehow they came to the university with more to, to face um, the many ways we teach than those students who come like from the, 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 typical, the typical students we had before. Uh, and that once they, they, they learn how to use the tools they already have and, and grab the ones they don't have, like they just, uh, do it better than other ones. That's that's what I think. I mean, yes, excellent, professor. Very good. Uh, now he um, asks, is there any Brazilian party? I think you mentioned that, but maybe you can uh, expand a little bit. 
Is there any Brazilian party that explicitly endorses black representation, considering that the black brown population consists of the majority of the Brazilian people? Uh, that, that explicitly endorses? No. <laughs> <laughs> No, that doesn't happen. What happens is, <laughs> I'm laughing, but I shouldn't be. <laughs> Anyways, it's just, uh, okay, so I'm showing you how guys here again, this graph by um, Jair Nicolau. That's very interesting. So let's um, uh, see first the parties from the center left, which would be this one, PDT, PSB, PT, PSOL. Yeah, the, the other ones are like uh, right or right, oh, center right. Um, you see here that PSOL, PSOL is a very small party um, and, and also a new party, like I think it was founded um, 2005 or six. Uh, it's the only one that like, um, um, that spends uh, the same amount of money uh, between all the candidates. Then you have PT here, which is a, a center left. Uh, but it's still, you, you guys see here, it spends twice as much with white people. Then you have PSCB, also a center left party that spends, um, again, if you, if, you, if you pick up here, uh, blacks and whites, you see a lot of difference and uh, a difference in pedity. Uh, so we don't have a party that explicit, uh, explicitly uh, incorporates uh, black people uh, into their, I don't know, structure or, or talk about this. We had back in the 80s um, with the, 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 the democratic opening in Brazil, we had uh, black uh, activists going to these following parties, PDT, PT, EMDB, that back then EMDB was a party that was center left, leaning center left, and then it became more center right. And I mean, it's 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 a party that is difficult to um, um, uh, to position it in the ideological spectrum. Uh, but back in the day, you, uh, the, the MEDB was was closer to what we now call a uh, center left uh, party. And then you had within the, the party structures of those parties, PDT, MDB, and PT, some um, uh, the participation of black people, but somehow uh, they never got to the highest ranks of the parties. Uh, and I don't know, and I don't know how to explain that. I, I'm actually doing a research on that, but I still don't have data, like enough data that I can share with you. Uh, that that's not only my own opinion. I think that racism is so widespread within the party structure that they face that that they that they give advantage to white people. And how does that work, based on my opinion and on what I I, I still have in terms of research, is um, how a party wants to to have as many people elected as possible, isn't it? So if a party is, uh, is in a competition uh, to a seat at the Senate, the party wants to have people elected because that's how they work. So they see if this candidate, candidate A, got better, got, 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 got I mean, has resource, comes from a family that's a, fam a family of politicians. Um, so has money, has a family of politicians, and um, in, the, in, the, in the past election was elected. So re-election is, is also a good indicative of, uh, uh, of, of, of the chance of a politician to, be, uh, to get into office again. So they use these three, um, um, uh, these three things to choose their candidates. So if the candidate has money, you can bring money to the party because now we have a public electoral fund. But before the electoral fund was private, so those who had more uh, chance to uh, uh, to mob, those who could mobilize more resources had more chance. And uh, if you are from a family uh, of politicians and you have many in Brazil, like you have like sometimes third, fourth generation of politicians in the same family, uh, this person is already socialized in a way that he or she understand how the politics the politics work. Uh, and that makes it easier for them to get elected. And also if the person already holds uh, uh, office, an office position, so the, the chance of being reelected is, is, is bigger. So the party looks at these three questions. 
and chooses the candidates based in either of them or three of our them. Uh, and because black people don't have money, don't have many uh, access to resource, can't mobilize uh, resources in the same way white people do. So that makes it difficult for them to be taken seriously within the party's structure. So that's that's how I think it works. Yeah, interesting. Uh, so Leo, Leo used to be our colleague here at UFG, she's from Germany. And she says, thank you for the lecture the lecture professor Rodriguez. As an exchange student at UFMG, I had to state my race. I was quite shocked. In Germany, we stopped talking about race, probably as a result of our history. It is crucial to us that there's only one human race, but of course, different ethnic groups and different kinds of skin color. But still, we would never ask in a questionnaire for any of those uh, attributes so that people wouldn't feel reduced on these. I understood that there are special policies at Brazilian universities, something like quotes for black students, you were talking about that, right? That should help against inequality. But also a lot of Brazilians told me stories in which white people stated that they, they are black so that they would have access to the university. How would you evaluate that situation? Do you think it makes sense to encourage a classification of races? What do you think about those quotes? Are they really doing something against, against inequality? Of course, you, you mentioned some of it, but maybe you can expand towards this part where um, she asked about the, the frauds and uh, the encouraging of this classification of races. Yeah, so, um, so race is a social construct. So to begin with, um, actually there is a quote by Tanehesi Coates um, um, an American journalist author that I like very much. That, and he says, a race is the child of races. Uh, what it means in any given society, uh, we divide people and we, we divide people and those who have higher status, those who have lower status. Um, some countries, some societies divide them based on skin color. Some societies divide uh, using other uh, a descriptive attributes. But I don't know any society that doesn't have uh, a status, uh, a, a way to organizing uh, a status into hierarchy, uh, to make hierarchies of people. Okay, so uh, that said, the Brazilian society did, did so using race. So did the United States uh, and other countries did the same, but in others did uh, uh, another way. Uh, but for many years in Brazil, I was somehow like what you said about Germany. The Brazilians wouldn't like to, to talk in terms of race. Uh, like even you, you wouldn't have a questionnaire like this one. I don't know, back in the nineties asking about your skin color uh, because it was still a very taboo question in Brazil. Uh, but the studies, uh, the research, and many, and also the, 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 the activism of black people have shown uh, that if you don't talk about race, you don't solve the problem. Because, okay, so uh, remember when I said um, something about the research in the thirties would say that there was no racism in Brazil, class was the way the society uh, worked. All right, class is, one way the society works, but it's not the only way. And so a white person coming from a working class family and a black person coming from a working, uh, working class family don't have the same opportunities. Even if they are, live in the same neighborhood, they go to the same school and like they share a lot of, uh, of their, life, their, their life experiences together. Uh, for one reason, the skin color is a way people use to determine who's have more access or not. To use an example, a Brazilian example, uh, it's very common that a black person um, gets stopped by a police officer and a white person next to her don't. Uh, uh, so that's why uh, people started to say uh, like, although class and race uh, runs in parallel waters, they don't come together that easily. And, uh, but the thing is, when race is used to discriminate it against, 
Of course, nobody wants to be uh, to identify themselves and be identified by others as a member of that race. But when race is used to benefit those people who want to, to, to be identified or identify themselves as, as such, to use uh, the Brazilian um, uh, quota system at the university as an example. So the quota system in Brazil, uh, let's see if I remember it right. It is based on social class. Um, um, a school like if you went to a public school in high school you you can you can uh you, you can compete in a quota system uh if your family uh, gets such amount of money i think it's 1.5 uh minimum wage per person and uh, if you're black but like if you're black you can only get to the university combining black blackness and social class if you are white you can get to the university as a, in a quota system for people who come from uh, public, public schools. Um, but then what's the problem in Brazil? Like you have uh, some uh, majors or some, um, uh, they're very prestigious. Let's say if you, wanna, if you wanna go to the medical school, if you wanna go uh, to law school, do engineering or uh, dentistry, dentistry, like some school, some of those schools are very prestigious. And then you uh, are the place you have more frauds. Uh, so people who are not necessarily black uh, identify themselves as black because we work with the self-identification in Brazil. So if one tells uh, that he or she is black, we basically say, all right, you are. Um, uh, that would, that this is a problem of uh, institutional design with this, this, this process, I think. Uh, but now we have the commission, Professor. Now we have the commission. I was going to get to the commission right now. Um, and, and again, I mean, I, I'd like to ask, because I don't want to be very strict in what I'm saying here, because the same way uh, people are very mixed in Brazil. And then uh, you can, uh, even the commission can make mistakes uh, because there are many ways of somebody, you can describe somebody like a person who is, I, I remember living in uh, Salvador, Years um, a few years ago, before coming to coming back to Blue Zone, and Salvador is a more uh, it's a city in which eighty to ninety percent of the population is black. Uh, some people who saw themselves as a white as as a white in Salvador wouldn't be seen as a white in Belo Horizonte. Uh, so the commission there's this also this problem because you have regional differences in ways people can be seen as black or not. In, in, in Brazil, uh, you, I think, I mean, uh, uh, thinking aloud again, uh, what I think would be the best way would, uh, would, would put a category in the head, self-identification, ancestry, like I remember a question they would say, uh, what's your skin color? And then you say, oh, black. So your father's skin color, your mother's, your gray grandmother, your grandfather, and then somehow like, uh, uh, trace a lineage of this person and see uh, how close she or he is from this thing. Uh, and then use the commission also, the hetero, uh, how's it called the commission? Uh, hetero classification, I think. Identification, uh, hetero identification. Identification, yes. Uh, because uh, if you use just one system or two systems, they still make up for, for uh, uh, they still can be, can make mistake. That's right. Okay, and then we have Denise. Uh, she asks, could you talk about the phenomena that foster the organic growth that made possible the election of this kind of mandate? She's probably talking about uh, mandates like the Benetton and Juntas. I mean, okay. how can they ever be, uh, how can it be possible, this kind of mandate? I think um, they are very interesting to study. Um, so I had, uh, especially, I, I will talk specifically about Gabinetona for many reasons. One is I'm, I'm a close friend uh, with one of the person, uh, one of the people who were elected. So I know the trajectory and how this came to be. And also is the one I study the most. Uh, so they started to go somehow, like back in, you guys remember like the, um, um, how's it called? In Spain, when there was those protests uh, back in 2000, and I think it was 11. I don't remember when. 
But um, one of the questions people would say was the Occupy, uh, there was uh, Occupy. Occupy was a big movement in many countries. You had Occupy Wall Street, you had um, Arab uh, Spring, you had, uh, you had in Spain as well, uh, a movement in which people will occupy the streets. And then they would start talking about this thing called Occupy the Politics. This is how uh, Gabinetona describes themselves. As, 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 as uh, like the formative way Gabinetona described itself is this, as, is, 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 uh, they are people trying to occupy the politics. Uh, so they somehow uh, use the idea of um, that representation, like that the, the institutional representation doesn't represent them anymore as a weapon to get represented. So they say the parties who are there, like the traditional parties, the traditional party system don't work for us. They don't ask questions. They are not interested in the questions and the things we are interested in. So those system is not good for us. But then there are like two ways of, 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 of leading with this. One is being cynical and saying, okay, I'm not gonna vote. Uh, I don't care who gets elected. I don't care about politics. And the other way is occupying and trying to to uh, once you're within the structure, change the structure. So that's the, uh, the second road is the road Gabinetona took. So they start to reunite, uh, like to, to gather people in Belo Horizonte uh, through a thing, through a collective called Muintas. So there are a lot of people from different uh, uh, parts of the city, different social classes, different uh, race, ethnicities, sexual orientation, gender, everything. They would come together every week and talk about politi politics. Uh, uh, like basics, basic things like how the political system works, uh, more complex things as what, uh, what unites us and what divides us. Like what are the questions that will bring us out together? That's what I call in this paper I'm writing intersectional representation, which is once they realized what united them, uh, they campaigned in a way that they would like tackle all those things, but not in a way that seemed uh, fake, in a way that was genuine. Because using the example of Aure Carolina, she is a person, um, she is a black woman uh, who was from the hip hop movement when she was young. She was, um, she lived in a certain part of town, but then she moved around to another part of town and she made friends in those both parts of town who are very different. One is a more um, affluent area of Belo Horizonte and the other one is a more um, um, uh, lower middle class part of the city. So she, uh, she also was part um, of um, one government, I forgot, but um, she was part of one government for a little while. There was a, um, a youth commission in, the, in this government. So she somehow moved around the city in a way that she was genuinely, genuinely interested in many things. She was not, as she told me in an interview, she was not a candidate. There was only a black woman. She was a black woman who was interested in youth questions was interested in LGBT questions, was interested in um, economics, was interested in improving the political system and the system of representation in a way that could incorporate uh, more people into it instead of excluding them. And when they campaigned, they, they were always talking about this in a ways, there was a, 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 a very interesting way they campaigned that they would say, my name is Cristiano, and you can vote for me or you can vote for Joana. Like it doesn't matter which one you choose as long as you choose one of us because uh, it doesn't matter if I am the one chosen or she's the one chosen, we will work on this platform. In a way there's an intersectional platform. So I think that's how you occupy politics. And that's why I'm so interested in this Gabinetona and many of the, 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 the collective mandates because they use this discourse, the anti-political, it's uh, anti-politics discourse to make it more political. There is um, a, a, a sentence Aure Carolina used uh, 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 a lot and I love that she calls about the reenchantment of politics. That she says, people uh, just became disenchanted and they, they are not interested in politics anymore and we need to reenchant those people and show them that um, outside of politics, there's no way 
We are, we are all political beings and we need to represent ourselves in a way that's not discretionary, discretionary, but is encompassing. So when she does that and, you, and people, and people see that it's genuine, that's not fake, because you can make this in a fake way and you can make this in a genuine way. Uh, everyone comes uh, together. So uh, the election of, uh, of, of, of Gabinia Tona has a lot to do with that. Another thing uh, that I didn't mention, and it's also very important, is the assassination of Marielle Franco. Marielle Franco was uh, a black uh, Brazilian city supervisor uh, from Rio de Janeiro, and she was uh, assassinated in 2018, I think. Uh, she was from the same uh, political uh, group as Aure Carolina and many of those people I'm talking about in the collective mandates. Uh, once she was assassinated, uh, there was like uh, a lot of people felt more inclinated to go into politics because they understood how vital uh, going to politics were uh, to keep them alive and to work towards what, what was their interest. So instead of keeping them away from the politics, which was uh, the intent of, their, of Marielle's assassination, it became uh, 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 a weapon or two to make, to make them more interested in politics. That's beautiful, very interesting. Um... Now we have Polly and Hamlin. They both have, um, they're going the same way. So I'm going to uh, put both questions together. Polly says, Professor, the movement Black Lives Matter, which has started in the US, had an impact in Brazil, at least in social media. But Black, life, black people are victim of violence and die every day in Brazil, most of the time in a, at a young age, sometimes inside their own houses. And we don't see this condition around, uh, this commotion around here. In your opinion, why the repercussion is bigger in the US than in Brazil? And is this a reflection of the racism and lack of consciousness? And then Hamlin goes further. I'm wondering the same, Polly. I'd like to know why are Black movements not taken seriously in Brazil with um, the hashtag Black Lives Matter? They're kind of on the spotlight now, but not much has changed in Brazil. Do you think that the lack of recognition of people as black and the denial of the existence of discrimination against black people in Brazil influences this? Um, I also think that having president who denies the existence of racism in the country doesn't help much either. Sure. Okay, so um, those are very two interesting questions. Um, so let's start with the, the first one. Uh, there are commotion uh, about um, black lives um, in Brazil. Uh, the thing is just that, um, I, I now don't have the data here, but is uh, I was working with it uh, over this data uh, a few days ago that shows that I, I think in 2019, uh, the police killed in Brazil around 5,000 people. I don't know the exact number right now. And out of this uh, 5,000 people killed by the police, 75% were black. And usually, you know, what is the typical person killed by the police in Brazil? It's black, it's male, it's young, and it's poor. And you have commotion. Um, as I said, like I mentioned before, the Marielle's death, um, Agatha's death. The, um, Agatha was a, was, a, was, a, was a girl, she was, um, I don't know, like 11, 12. Uh, she was killed uh, last year in Rio de Janeiro. Uh, we have um, João Pedro, I forgot his name now. I think it's João Pedro, who was uh, a teenager who was killed um, a few months ago in, in Rio de Janeiro as well. So you have commotion, but usually this commotion is um, within the community uh, where those cases happened. And the police brutality in Brazil, it's bigger than other countries. So just to, to, to make a comparison between uh, the number of deaths by police in Brazil and the West. So in the West, there were a thousand, uh, the police killed a thousand people uh, in 2019. Uh, the US population is 300 million people. Uh, the Brazilian population is 200 million people, 220 uh, something uh, between uh, these two numbers. Uh, and the police killed 5,000 people. So the Brazilian police is way more violent and brutal than the American police. <laughs> Not only that, when uh, people go to take the streets 
uh, to demonstrate against police brutality, they are, they encounter more brutality. So every time Brazilians go to the streets to complain, to, to demonstrate, uh, to grief, they are, they're, they're met, they, 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 found, they find, they find more police brutality. So the costs of, of demonstrating in Brazil are higher than other countries. And also you don't have much solidarity from white people to these deaths. Uh, one of the things that um, uh, that's very uh, interesting in terms of how it worked in the West is how white people took front of the protests. Like there were like pictures of of of, of these. Um, 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 how do I say? I mean, it's like a, a barricade of, of white people uh, helping the protests and and, and, and taking care of, of, of that. That makes a lot of uh, that's very good for the protests because the costs of the person is already discriminated against, and then they go to protest, and then they are faced with more violence and they are at risk of losing their jobs and uh, being retaliated uh, retaliated against in many ways. Uh, so those are things that one must take in account, into account uh, before going to protest. And, that, and the cost is very high in Brazil. So that's why I think the commotion is different. Uh, it's not that, it's, that, that we don't see commotion in Brazil. It's not that it's less. Uh, it's just that it's more um, uh, concentrated in the communities that face more violence. And once they protest, they are faced with even more violence. It's just the way the, Bra the Brazilian society is, is a very violent society, unfortunately. I mean, and, and people have to take that into account. Um, also, another thing, of course, the West uh, is the major political and, economical and, and economic country in the world. So everything that happens in the West has way more coverage, media coverage, and, and has way more impact than what happens in other countries. Um, the difference now is that I think this movement as a, a, an international movement is, was interesting to see um, uh, Black Lives Matter protests happening in Berlin, uh, London, Paris, uh, Bel uh, here in Belo Horizonte, Sao Paulo, and other, in other parts of, of, of the globe, because it shows that people are now more aware that racism is a very bad thing. They uh, must uh, come together to solve this problem. So, and I, I, I just, I forgot the second question was about the social movements not being taken seriously, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, I think the black movement in Brazil, it's a very successful movement, uh, but it was never a mass movement. It was never a movement that like, uh, took millions of people to the streets to demonstrate. And, uh, but it, it has chosen a road, especially the road that, that led us to the quarter system uh, in universities um, and the transformation in the educational system that was very successful. It's just, as the, 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 uh, it's just that the, the Brazilian society, has, as, as the question said, I mean, the, 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 the lack of racial consciousness among the average Brazilian makes it more difficult to bring people together. Because the first question is, people need to uh, be uh, aware that they are Black. And that takes a long time. Uh, so the number of uh, people describing themselves as Black has gone, on, uh, has gone up since the 80s. So back in the 80s, people would go in the census and say, and, 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 and check uh, the black box at a 45%. Now this number is 7%. That is what, it's not that the black population grew from, uh, from the 80s to now. It's just that, that more black people see themselves as blacks. And once more black people see themselves as blacks, they will be more aware of their disadvantage and also will demonstrate more and protest more for the things that are of their interest. Another thing I, I also didn't, um, um, I think it's important is uh, people who demonstrate usually uh, if, if, if they lack, I don't know, if, um, if they don't have money, if they don't have food at home, if, I mean, they're missing many things in their lives, probably they will not demonstrate against races because the priorities are other priorities. And once they have those things 
uh, organized, they might protest also for racism. It's just that the, the, the black Brazilian, the typical black Brazilian has way many other priorities. Work too much, gets paid less, uh, it's in very vulnerable situations, and it, and it makes it hard for those people to protest. It's not that the, 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 the black movement it's not, uh, has not been successful, or it's not being taken seriously, it's just that it has chosen to grasp or to tackle uh, two important questions with like job markets and education and now uh, access to the political system. But it has chosen like uh, one uh, focus of action and it has worked so far. That's excellent, excellent. Uh, now we're, we're running out of time, uh, yes. but there is one very interesting question but, uh, that we might end with it. But uh, before that, uh, there are many thanks for you. Thank you very much, Professor. I hope that you yes, just, just get a glass of water. I can. I still can sure. listen. To <laughs> <laughs> uh, go ahead. You have yes. right live um, class. We run out of uh, water sometimes. Arena doesn't want the lecture to end. Yeah, me neither. So interesting, right? So interesting. I'm back. <laughs> Great. Uh, and they, I'm, I'm just going to read some of the comments because they're so... Um, uh, thank you, Professor. Um, it's... Uh, thank you very much, Professor. Louisa says, I hope that in time... I'll take the many chances I have to make a difference. So you should, Louisa. Thank you, Professor. Jessica says, uh, how about the challenge? Oh, no, this is the question. I'm not going to ask now. It's nice <laughs> that now students ask for subjects about race. That's interesting. At the university, it seems like the chances have never been equal in Brazil politics. Race is the child of racism. Professor Gaffs is um, saying how, how impressive is that uh, sentence, right? Yeah. Uh, Denise says she's thinking in other perspectives. Um, uh, Leo says, thank you very much for your answer. Interesting how much the perspective on those topics differ from cultural traditions, one cultural tradition to the other. And then Louisa says, thank you very much, Professor. I think that he couldn't have chosen a better topic to end the SSBS. I enjoyed your class very much. And then she wants to meet you personally. Yes, we all would love. And then Please, she, COVID, then, it goes away. <laughs> and then she says she loves the flag behind you. All and right. Professor. Mm -hmm. uh, and, the, uh, and then Hamlin saying the Brazilian police killed 6,160 people in 2009. Uh, I won't be interrupted. That's what Marielle said. Thanks, Professor. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the lecture. And then the question is um, a very interesting question, too, I think you could end is uh, Alexia asks, how about the challenges of being a black professor at USMG? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> the personal question. <laughs> this is the last question? <laughs> there are others, but we won't have time for them. <laughs> <All right. laughs> August, I don't know how to answer the question. Um, there are like many challenges and First of all, I think it's a very important place to be. Uh, I would start with like, I'm very fortunate to be, uh, to be a professor, especially at the university that I graduated from and I, I, I'm really uh, in love with this institution. That's why I came back <laughs> because Salvador was much more fun than Belo Horizonte. <laughs> but uh, I think the challenges are, we are so very few professors. Uh, like just to, 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 to change from me and to think um, in, in a more uh, in terms of perspective, like we're so very few professors and uh, we have a high demand of things. First is 
if we work with race and racism, as I do as a topic of studies, sometimes we are in this, um, um, uh, in this intersection that's very problematic, in which people don't see us as, as valuable scholars as others because they think, oh, because you stood race, racism, anti-racism and stuff, you're doing something that's self-interested uh, and is not necessarily objective which I disagree completely, because sometimes if we are not doing what we, we're doing, nobody else would be doing. Uh, uh, the second is we, uh, there like so much demand from the black students because their, their lived experiences of racism in the university, of uh, not being taken seriously, of sometimes having problems that only us black people understand, of you know, in a way that, that somebody looks at you, um, uh, they like they diminish your ability or capability and stuff. Uh, all of those, like they come to us sometimes, you work with both of us, a professor academic who is devaluated um, for doing one kind of job that nobody else is interested in doing. And then you are like taken aback sometimes with so much demand from black students that I love, I mean, that you have, you become a mentor, a psychologist, a friend, uh, you cry together because like the experiences, the universe is still uh, a place there is very much white in a sense that a lot of uh, black students come from first generation families to go to university. So they don't know how the university works, I mean. What, what happens in the class? How do I approach a professor? How do I come and ask for a scholarship? How do I apply to um, an intern position? Like sometimes they don't know, they, they, they don't know many of the ways the university can work um, towards the, to, uh, to benefit them. And uh, it's, I think it's my duty as a person who had so many opportunities in life, like to share those opportunities with them. So um, I, uh, one of the things I like the most about being a professor is this, that like I have to have like a face-to-face -face conversation with black students that I say it can be, it is difficult, but it can be very good if you know how to take advantage of everything we have to offer. But sometimes nobody's telling you that we have so much to offer. And then like this is the intersection of being way more than a professor way more, having way more activities than we are paid and uh, trained for, being evaluated by some of our colleagues for not doing the real job they think we're doing, uh, and also dealing with our own insecurities and difficulties of, um, I don't know, being the only, like in my department, so we are 26 professors, and I'm the only black professor in the department. Uh, it's a very interesting, uh, nice department where we are friendly to each other, but, but that can be very lonely sometimes. And then when we go to the other departments, it's not very much, uh, there's not much difference. So I don't know how many black professors there is like in the, uh, at, at the entire university. We are like 3,000 uh, professors, I think. Professors, I think. But I, I, I would say that we're not even 5% of all the professors and what we but it's like been it. changing right it's i think it's been changing especially because I, we have more black people in the university so we have more black people taking up master's degree and a doctor's degree so i think this this role will you know continue rolling until it scales up to you know eventually having more than 50 percent <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I'm not so optimistic about this, but I think it has changed. Uh, 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 until now, it has changed into like for the undergrads and uh, the graduate program. So you do see more black people um, uh, taking like doing masters and PhD programs, uh, but some of them still haven't gotten to be a professor. But then this is a whole different question, a whole different lot of uh, uh, topic because then the, the way we select professors and um, I mean, th 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 that would be very difficult to grasp here uh, in such a small time. Uh, but I do think, but it's still very difficult to get. And also because it's like, a, a, I don't know the word in English, but you know, it just gets difficult over time. So uh, to be an undergrad, you have 106. To be to the graduate program, you have twenty, and then to be a professor, just just one. 
So just few of us will get. Yeah. Uh, and also it take longer. So you you can you can you can uh, you can change the, the student body every four years, but you cannot uh, you cannot change uh, the faculty body every four years because we spend thirty now four years as as professors. So it's different. So uh, I don't think we're gonna get. Uh, 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 to an even proportion of blacks and white professors, uh, not only because racism is still persistent, but also because uh, we have we are very few professors and we stay way too long doing what we're doing. But so basically, like the, the, the challenges are are, uh, are 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 these. Like it's very interesting to be uh, with the black students and and being able to. Uh, uh, share with them my opportunities and share with them uh, the knowledge I have, not like the, 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 the academic knowledge, but like the, 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 the what uh, Patricia Collins called, uh, 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 she calls the outsider within, which is an experience of being in and out of the same situation because I'm a black person who came from a particular set of, of experiences. I share those experiences with my black students and because I am a professor and, and share a set of experiences with my white colleagues, I also am in between worlds and that can be very beneficial for the, for the students I teach. Uh, and of course it's complicated for me as a person but everything is complicated in life. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Professor, thank you very much for being here with us. We're honored to have you. We've ended in such a high note. And now, so that we can see everyone's faces, uh, yeah. I would like everyone to open up their, um, Ooh, their uh, yeah. <laughs> cameras. <laughs> yeah, so that we can see everyone. So thank that you we guys. Can see all the faces and all the you know, diverse audience we have. Thank you very much. Um, don't forget to uh, come to our luau. Oh, what and is this luau? I was yes, the there is a luau at 1.30. I'm going to leave here. Oh, oh my God, where is it? Uh, the, um, we would kindly ask you to fill out a form so that we can um, know your impressions about the course, we can improve for further additions. And uh, it would be very nice if you could kindly help us out making this even better. This has been such a great time uh, being here with you and having you know, uh, uh, such wonderful guests as uh, professors and uh, also having you and your questions and welcoming your questions, right? And then I just want, I'm gonna put here the form, the, the the link to the um, to the um, form. I'm gonna I'm gonna leave it here at the chat. Okay, and then I, I go to the chat and uh, and fill it, right? Yeah, uh, yes, the students, yes. Oh, it's for students, oh, not for yeah, yeah. Yeah, not for you. No. <laughs> <laughs> Luciana, may I just give a few words? Sure. Yes, of course, Professor. I, I just so wanted to uh, hello, same my same very same dear same colleague same. and friend, Cristiano. You, you really delivered an, a, a splendid uh, talk, and everyone just fell in love for you. I can <laughs> tell you in all honesty, I mean, you, you, you never fail. You're amazing. <laughs> Thank you very much for delivering that much. And uh, I want to thank you all, guys, every and each one of you students for being a part of this course. It's been a great experience for, for us as well. I mean, our team was very impressed and very thankful to you, to your home universities. And uh, I tell you in all honesty, uh, and please don't tell the previous classes, batches, but that was the best one we have ever had. Thank you very much for making this uh, summer school so special. And I truly, really hope I can see you all walking down the streets on our campus one day. This is my hope. Uh, you have definitely uh, accomplished your mission and improved time and again that the world is such a 
big reservoir of talent. Thank you very much for being with us. And don't miss this luau. It's very promising. Uh, <laughs> very much. I look forward yeah. to meeting you all one day in my lifetime. Thank you, guys. Thank you, my team. You were amazing. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. This has been a, uh, very nice being part of this. Uh, everyone that uh, was part of it, all, all our team was so proud to be part of this of such great um, event, right? And we, we thank everyone who's been uh, here with us. Max, Elaine, Del, Jessica, Rick, uh, Vitor, Arthur, who else? Who did I forget? <laughs> Jessica, uh, Catherine, um, hey. all this great team that was together with us. And uh, I would just, just to finish up, Victor, I think, have uh, some words for you talking about um, uh, um, an event that we promote. Where is Victor? Is he there? Hello? Elaine, where is Victor? Well, I don't, I, I don't know if it's, he's here. But anyway, do you want to say it, uh, Arthur? Can you uh, say about the cafe? Yeah, yeah, I can, I can explain. So, hello, people. Uh, and I'm part of uh, International Affairs of FMG. And we have an event that is calling, uh, that calls Café Intercultural. That is some, it's a moment when we can share like projects and share anything uh, about about, uh, about we want to talk like some subject or uh, our search and I would like to invite you to to talk about your country or uh, uh, like any any topics that you want to talk that you consider important uh, in in a moment with the UFMG community and so if you wanna just like message me or Victor or send an email to uh, Acolhimento UFMG and, yeah, yeah, and send in the group. Uh, yeah. We can uh, schedule a time because this event yeah. happens in a monthly basis or every 15 days after, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, every, uh, now it's gonna, I think it's gonna be every 15 days. Every 15 I don't know, days. we are, uh, we are. We are and, and we invite with. someone to talk and to share, yes. share about their experience yeah, about, about their countries yeah. and then we would kindly ask you or some of you to join us for these and then we can schedule one of these sessions with you yes so please, can... please 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 <laughs> yes we want it would you be very to talk about your country talk and, about your experiences yeah. and your um, yeah universities that'd be great but then yeah. we'll uh, we'll reach be... you later on okay yeah so, including arena i think she is going to participate. I don't know. Oh, yet, is she? That's but... great. Excellent. Yeah. All right. So, um, so anyway, so thank you. Thank you very much again. Uh, thank you for being here. Thank you, Professor Fishan. And then I forgot, I forgot Theo and Professor Lucas and Professor Thompson also to thank for the team. I'm sorry I missed you guys. <laughs> but, uh, and uh, we'll see each other later on for the final party, <laughs> right? See you, bye-bye. I'll bye. see you guys, bye-bye, thank, thank you. Thank you, have a nice day. Yeah, you too.